And that's good. It is good to see you this morning. We have a number of announcements printed in your bulletins. And once again, I don't know if Laura has anything else she wants to add about the pickleball party, except that it's in there and the youth are still ready. Yes, we're February 4th. February 4th. Still time to sign up for that fundraiser, which is in two weeks, right? Yes, two weeks. Go to Seminary Learn to read the calendar in two weeks. Session meeting is this. Where's my note? I lost it. Session meeting is tonight, but before session at 6 o'clock, there is a meeting of the corporation. So elders, please make sure you are here at 6 o'clock. Does that sound right, John, or did I get that all wrong? I got that all wrong? Save me. I had a yellow piece of paper with all that written on it, and it has just walked off on it. Hey, the board of trustees is meeting at six o'clock, and the session will meet right after that. I got, I found it. So, elders are reminded to pick up their informational packets in their boxes. This is this is a bad omen for this morning. At least I downloaded my sermon before church started. And there's other stuff in there as well. Bible study still is Thursday at 1 o'clock. And tomorrow, it will still be chilly. I know, it'll still be chilly. It will be. But tomorrow from 4 to 6, we'll be passing out food out in front of the Fellowship Hall, as we have been doing for months now. The information is on social, as well as there are flyers floating around. Please share the word. Spread the word. We've already begun passing out stuff. If you know someone who would benefit from receiving some food bags, we have them. There is also frozen turkey, some a limited quantity available, and enough shredded cheese to sink a battleship that we've been given as well. And I am not kidding on that either. No, I'm not. <laughs> we have plenty to go with. So please, if you're able to help out, come on over. And if you're not able to come out, please share that word with anybody who might need food in this time. Are there other announcements that you'd like to share this morning? Steve? Uh, we will have a congregational life meeting next Sunday at 4 o'clock. So be there on that committee to be aware. If you would like to be on that committee, we'll be here to be in fellowship all 4 o'clock next Sunday. It'll be important. Congregational life next week, 4 o'clock. Come and get involved in the ongoing ministry of Bethesda. A lot going on, a lot to be part of. The big question and the big update that a lot of people have been asking about is Miss Dorothy, who had surgery on Friday. And I'm going to look at Jill, and she's going to nod at me. She did really well in surgery. And if everything goes according to plan, she's sitting up in her chair this morning, and they're hoping to move her to Encompass behind Piedmont tomorrow. There'll be opportunities to help out around the family and to help Edward with other things. Just be keeping an eye on it, and we'll be sharing that information with you as we move forward. Anything else we want to sh that you want to share with them, Jill, in this time? No, don't have to, but I just want to put it out there if you do. She's doing good. Family appreciates your prayers and your support. Is there anything else this morning we need to share as the body of Christ today? Then if not, I invite you to be still and to know that he is God as together we listen to our prayer.
Will you stand as you are able as we begin with our worship, our call to worship today? I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There is a sense of Christ's presence here that renews our spirits. Let us rejoice in his presence and sing the glories of his name. Will you pray with me as we begin our worship time together? Gracious God, as we come into your house this morning, we come to encounter you. We come to be shaped and to be molded by you. We come to be changed by you. We come to learn from you. And so, Lord, in this time as we pause, in this time as we worship, have your way in our hearts. Have your way with this body of believers. It's in Jesus' name we ask this together. Amen. Our first hymn, our hymn of praise, is in your hymnals today. On page 276, it is great is thy faithfulness, number 276. together humble ourselves before God and confess our sins to the Lord. Let us pray our prayer of confession. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring all nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your kingdom, for we live casual lives, 
ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lies as truth, exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Grant us wisdom in your way. And to seek things that will endure when Christ comes to judge the world. Amen. Please join me in a time of silent confession before the Lord. Amen. Now there is rejoicing in heaven, for you were lost and are now found. You were dead and now are alive in Christ Jesus. Go in peace. The Lord has put away all your sin. Amen. other now signs of peace and reconciliation. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to turn to your neighbor and offer them Christ's peace this morning. first reading of scripture this morning is taken from the gospel of Mark and we'll be in chapter 1 today verses 14 through 20 I invite you to listen and to hear the word of the Lord from Mark you know, starting in verse 14 now after John was arrested Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Be well, I'd like to invite the children of the church to come down this morning for a few moments. We're going to get to all the heavy, because we got big kids, they're going to get to the heavy, important stuff today. Oh, I hope you're ready. We got big, heavy stuff today. Oh, boy. And since we got the big kids, we got we can do big, heavy lifting, right? Allie just looks at me like, absolutely not. <laughs> and Cameron, of course, says, so sure, why not? He doesn't even know what we're going to talk about yet, but he's ready to go, right? Deep end of the pool? Maybe? Probably. Probably? Right. Never, don't ever agree to things you don't know right, until it's too late. So it's good to see you this morning. I am wondering as we're going to we're going to read in a little while from someone in the Old Testament, and this individual who is near and dear to my heart because he is near and dear when my children were little to their hearts. He is what is called a prophet. Okay. Now, what is a prophet? There is the deep question. What's a prophet? Someone who sends messages from God and spreads good news. Someone who, someone who sends messages from God and 
spreads, spreads the good word. Okay, what do you think? Maybe? Does this sound right, Ali? Would you add on to it? She's thinking, and he, you kind of painted with a very broad brush, didn't you, Cameron? Why do you say that? Uh, they, are, are, they are sent from God? Okay. And, they, and do, they, do they hear from God? Always? Sure. Okay. And it's a good word? Can you define that? So, somebody who says good things. Ah, so he says, like, Jesus is coming. Love your neighbor. Yes, okay. And they're well received? Okay, ah, the people behind you are starting to shift. No. Not always, my friend, right? And there is the trouble of a prophet, right? Because they're not always well received, are they? They're not always well received. But they do hear from God every time, right? We believe they are in the Bible, right? That God speaks to their hearts and gives them a message. One, one prophet in particular who we're not reading today, Jeremiah, he was known as the weeping prophet. Now, why would he be the weeping prophet? What does it mean to weep? And why would he be crying? It's not a trick question. Why would he be crying? Because his job is hard. He is sad. The people do not listen to Jeremiah much when he says something. And what does that do? That breaks his heart because it breaks God. Being a prophet is not always an easy job. But And why is that? Because their message is often quite hard to hear. When the prophet comes into the people in the Bible's midst, they bring a word from God, certainly. And that word is good because ultimately God's word is good for us, right? Even if it's hard for us to hear it. In the case today, it's the word from Jonah. Do you know Jonah's story? Yes. What does, what does Jonah have to tell the people? Jonah tells people in Nineveh. Nineveh? Yeah. Nineveh. You were close. Nevada and Nineveh, they're very close. You've got, you, you get points, yes. Um, what did he tell them? That if they don't start listening or obeying God, that's the same as what Jonah That's not a good word, is it? Would you like to hear that if you don't listen to God, your house is going to fall down? No. no. That's a tough one, right? But what does the Bible do? What, what happens with the Ninevites, the people that are going to listen? Do they listen? Well, Jonah actually went the opposite way, and he went onto a boat. Yes. And there's a terrible storm. Absolutely was. And he apparently went onto a boat. Why? Because he didn't listen to God. Yeah. God wasn't too happy about that. Ah, easy job, huh? Being a prophet. And Jonah, so what he said is, he said, throw me off of this ship. Yep. So the storm would stop. And? Wicked. And? And got swallowed by a fish. And? Three days, three nights. And then got out, swallowed by a fish, vomited in the mouth. Oh, boy. Um, would you like to be Jonah being vomited out on a, by a fish onto a beach? Yeah, that's a great job, right? I love that job. And then, uh, yeah. He was. He said, "Sorry, God." Did he? Well, he felt guilty. There you go. And. And. Then he went to. Nineveh. Nineveh and told the people. And. God. And God. And what happened to Jonah? More or less. It's a hard life Jonah lived, right? Sometimes being a prophet, it's a joy to be a prophet, right? Because God speaks to your to their hearts and gives them a message, a message that they want to be faithful and share, right? But sometimes it's hard, right? Jeremiah was hard, right? The people didn't like him. And there are others. Amos wasn't liked very much by his peers. Jonah 
caused a great storm, swallowed by a fish, didn't want to serve the Lord, did he? Didn't want to go to these people. As my children would tell you from their lessons of the veggie tale, the Ninevites slapped each other with fishes. I mean, who wants to go talk to them? Right? That's just the way that it is. Read your, listen to your veggie tales. I mean, come on. I know, right? I see you back there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. It's good stuff. But when the Lord speaks to your heart, it's the point. As a prophet, you have to listen. And God speaks to all of our hearts, doesn't he? It may not be as blunt as it is with a prophet in our Bible, but everybody has the Lord speaking. Just like last week when we talked about what does God's voice sound like? Everybody hears God's voice, for God is in all of us. It may not be as dramatic as it was with Jonah telling us to go to an entire city that's three days takes to walk from side to side and preach a message of redemption and, and ask to be forgiven. But certainly God does whisper into each of our hearts that we are to live differently and to share that love with other people. God's word is in us. And as Cameron began, it is a good word that we are to share. So continue to listen to God, just as Jonah did. And God will continue to be with you, even when it's hard. Maybe she doesn't go along to do it all the time. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you for these young people. Be with Allie, be with Cameron as they keep growing in their faith and growing in their wisdom and growing in their ability to hear and to listen and to understand and to respond to your voice. And help them to remember people like Joan who didn't always want to listen, but did listen. And as he listened and obeyed, you used him as you'll use Allie and you'll use Cameron to spread the gospel. Be with them both today in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can return to your seat. Thanks for coming up. As we come to our time of joys and concerns, we have, I have both lists that were shared in our Sunday school time that we will be praying for together. As I was setting up this morning and getting my things together before the service, Lorraine let me know that as we added last week to our prayer list, her sister-in-law, Teresa, who has just entered into hospice, she has entered into the church triumphant this week. And so we will be praying for Teresa's friends and family as they go through their time of trial and suffering. Are there other joys and concerns that you, church family, would like to share together? Dick. I have joy. Uh, Just joy. My latest sister was born this past Wednesday, Sarah Cooper. Stella? Stella. Stella. I thought that. I was like, I can't be right. I'm not hearing you right. Well, we are glad to hear about Stella. We will pray for mother and father and for, for your family as well. Are there others? Johnny. My granddaughter, Walter, is a lot better. I appreciate the prayers and all. It was Nurse Joni who did it, wasn't it? Yeah, I think a little bit of that. Uh, a little bit of that. I figured it was. We're glad to hear Walker is doing better. I know it's been quite a journey for her through all this stuff. Glad to hear that. Are there others this morning? Edie? Liz is doing well with her knee replacement surgery and her physical therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to hear the update that Liz is doing better. She keeps healing and battling through PT following that knee replacement. Are there others this morning? It is good to hear updates of joy, I will tell you. The list can get so heavy with needs, and that's a good thing to have needs and to be aware of what's going on, but it's also good to share joy and to know that God is at work around us and that prayer works and it transforms lives. So with that in mind, let us be the church. Gracious God, we know you are at work here in the body of Christ. 
And not just here, you are at work with the body of Christ everywhere. And we testify to that this morning. For your hand has been touching our lives in ways that we will speak of together and ways we do not even understand yet. But we know and we are confident and we take strength and hope from the fact that you are not done with us. We are glad to know that Liz continues to heal following her knee replacement, that her strength and mobility, range of motion continues to improve, and we are glad for that word. We are glad to know that Walker continues to get better following her time with pneumonia and RSV. It's been a long road for her. But we're glad to hear she is getting better. We are glad to hear that Stella has entered into the world and that mother and father are doing well. Be with her, guide her, order her steps, guide her life. We pray for Melanie as we have learned that she has COVID. We pray that you help her body to fight that infection off, that she gets her health under control, gets her strength back. Be with Jennifer and John Mark as they deal with bad headaches this morning, not feeling well. Restore their health quickly today. We pray for Teresa's friends and family as they go through this difficult time of grieving. Wrap them in your comfort and hold them in your grace. We pray for Pat and John Lochner, knowing that you have been with John through his immunotherapies and that you will continue to keep him <coughs> close to your heart as he goes through the future procedures. Be with him today. Be with Nikki, be with Dee as they each heal in their own ways following their procedures. Be with Bert as she offers them love and support as she is able to following these times. We think of Benny Coxman, who is in the hospital with surgery tomorrow. Watch over Benny. Be with Anita as they get ready for that. We're glad to know that Dorothy has come through surgery well. And as the transition towards Encompass gets ready to happen tomorrow, be with her as she is getting stronger each day. Help her body to heal, to regain its mobility and its strength. Be with Edward, be with Jill, be with the entire family as they surround her in love and support in this time. Help us as the body of Christ to be present in, the, in her life, in their lives, and in the lives of this community as we are able to. As well, Lord, we lift up the unspoken needs which live in this community and in this church, for there are those needs. And we don't have to say anything about them to each other, but we can just commit them over to you. For you are there. You are present. You are watching over them. And so first, Lord, now, right in this time, we, we want to spend just a couple of moments with you. Giving over those unspoken needs and just talking to you about that which lives in our hearts. So hear your people as they pray to you. There is so much hustle and bustle, Lord, that we deal with each day. Just having this quiet moment to be there with just you. To tell you what we already know, you already know. It helps us. It grounds us. It strengthens us. It heals us. It grows and restores our faith with you, in you with us.
we lift up as well today those names which are in our military prayer list and those which live in our heart to have served our country and continue to serve our country today we also lift up to you chase davis and zoe beyonda we pray for pierce dewey and sully foy we pray for nicholas mcateer and gay jor we pray for michael wilkinson wilkerson and all who have answered the call to serve our country, we commit them to you, we lift them to you, keep them safe, and protect them. Loving God, as we continue in our worship time, be with us. And hear us together, Lord, your children now, as we offer you the first prayer, which you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Lorraine and thank the choir this morning. The text for today is taken from Jonah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. I didn't know why you need to read it. Cameron summed it up perfectly for us, didn't he? He just got it all. So, but forgive me for repeating what Cameron so perfectly summarized. <laughs> Starting in chapter 3 this morning. And Cameron, I know you can hear me back there. You did a great job, young man. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. <coughs> so Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three-day walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, and going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Excuse me, let us pray. Loving God, as we pause to consider this story and these words, we ask you to once again speak to our hearts and speak to our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a way of talking about the Bible and sharing its stories that turns it into a self-help manual. A self-help manual full of good advice about how to navigate the problems of life that you face each day. But that way of utilizing God's Word is often mixed with platitudes, with niceties, and with vague ways of addressing the true struggles that you and I face each day, each and every day, rather than seeing the fullness of the Word that rests before us that we're reading. That approach often makes us look quite silly at the end of the day when we find ourselves reading a book like Jonah and studying that narrative. The book of Jonah pushes us into a lot of questions. It pushes us onto them. It makes us wonder about a lot of things. It draws us to consider how we are living and how are we choosing faithfulness each and every day as we encounter our culture and the struggles each experience of each day brings before us. You can't turn this book, Jonah, or this story that Cameron so eloquently retold to us into a moral fable. Because notice how often Jonah went the wrong way. How often he chose poorly. Notice how frequently the Ninevites behaved only to save their own lives and not out of any sense of faithfulness themselves or faithful response. This is not a moral book or a moral story. Rather, it's a story of faithfulness. Jonah's story is the story of how, in spite of many choices to the contrary, in spite of humanity's consistent choice to the contrary, to be unfaithful in the midst of it, God remains steadfastly committed to redeeming and to reconciling his people, whose first choice is not often to be reconciled and redeemed by God. Therein lies the reflection that we're going to consider and think about today. As our season of Epiphany continues, and as we chug on towards Ash Wednesday and Lent, I wonder about our choice as a church to remain faithful to God. 
I wonder about how our faithful, how will we be faithful when we stand before God and feel his call in our lives? We will have moments, as Jonah did, moments we might like to forget happened, moments that we might like to forget impacted us as they did. But can we use these moments, these choices, to help us further the message of redemption as we seek to be faithful in our world and with our community? The first lesson that Jonah teaches us, that his story teaches us, is one of repetition. I want to call it. In chapter 1, verse 2, God calls Jonah the first time. Well, we do not know for certain what Jonah was doing before God called him. We can infer that Jonah was receptive to hearing the voice of the Lord that first time. We might believe that we can infer that Jonah had a relationship with God, or perhaps Jonah had previously heard God speak to his heart and mind. He knew what it sounded like, maybe. Maybe a parent or a devoted family member helped him learn to distinguish the voice of God from all the other voices that occur in his life. Either way, when God speaks to Jonah in chapter 1, verse 2, there is a familiarity, I think, with that voice. In chapter 1, God calls Jonah, and the direction is clear. Hear it again. God says, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. This is a message of preaching, of repentance. It is a message that I believe God knew that Jonah would faithfully execute. Otherwise, why would God call Jonah in the first place? Why would God not give the message to Amos or Hosea? They were contemporary prophets to Jonah during this time. God knew Jonah could do this, you see. And what's more, God knew Jonah would do this. Jonah would be faithful to the calling that he is given. God believed that when he spoke to Jonah in chapter 1, that Jonah would faithfully serve the Lord, just as we claim we would do when God speaks into our hearts and calls us to serve in his name. But as Cameron told us as well, Jonah goes the wrong way, doesn't he? And we know this quite well. As I talked about with the children and with my lectionary group this week, the Veggie Tales have taught me that lesson, that Jonah goes the exact wrong direction. Jonah does not obey. Jonah is not faithful. But God does not forget him. Even though he is not faithful, God still is. In spite of poor choices, in spite of sinful acts, God sees what God has always seen in each of us. A level of faithful response that is possible. And he sees it still in the prophet, even as the prophet stays in the belly of the fish for three days. Even when his people go the wrong way and do not practice faithfulness, God remembers them. God remembers what he saw in their hearts, how he called them to participate in his mission. He knows that while Jonah was not faithful in the moment, he tried to escape the calling heading towards Tarshish, there was something that was deep down inside of Jonah that made God call him in the first place. He saw it there. And so now we come to our text today, as Jonah has been, as we heard as well this morning, vomited up on the beach. In 3.2, God reminds Jonah and us of the calling and the faithfulness of the call. Hear it again. As God says to Jonah, get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it a message that I will tell you. And while the wording is slightly, slightly different, the call is the same. The destination is the same. The tone is the same. The tense of the verbs are the same. The mission is the same. God is the same. God is not going to let his mind be totally changed because Jonah, again, chose poorly previously. God still calls people who might be unfaithful for a season to participate in his mission moving forward. Grace breaks through because God breaks through. God is faithful to us. 
when we are not always as faithful to God. That's the first lesson Jonah teaches us today. It is one of repetition and calling. If the first lesson from Jonah was that God's stay, call stays with us in our lives even when we are unfaithful for seasons, and even when we end up in the belly of a great whale, then the second is similar in its nature. But let's look at our story some more before I tell you what it is. Our text ends with God forgiving the Ninevites of their sins. That message is recorded in verses 6 through 9 of chapter 3. In fact, the redeeming and forgiving of the great city is the entire substance of the message of Jonah's ministry. It is his call to preach and to evangelize to these people. This is the hope that lives behind God's call to the prophet. They will repent, and the Lord will forgive. That's why Jonah is sent to them. God will forgive and will redeem the people of Nineveh because of whatever it is Jonah is going to say as he walks that full day's journey into the city and proclaims whatever message is going to come from his mouth. From the king to the lowest peasant who lives in that place, they will all receive the mercy of the Lord as they confess their sins to God. They will put on sackcloth, the word says. They will put on ashes. They will stand before Yahweh, and they will repent. And based on what Jonah preaches that day, something will happen. Jonah is sent to preach and to evangelize to these people, to all of them. And he does. And he is once again faithful. The word for the impending destruction that God is going to do as he sends them to this place to bring upon these people is the same word that is used in Genesis when the Lord speaks about what he's going to do to Sodom and the destruction there. This is a serious situation here. God has sent a prophet to confront a serious thing. And God forgives. But God is going to forgive these people, these non-Abrahamic people, people, these people who do not have any relationship with God, these people, these Ninevites, they are not children of the covenant. They have little, if any, history with God. I wonder if they even know who Yahweh is. And so, because the Ninevites do not likely know who God is, or what a relationship with God looks like, or even how one confesses one's sins before God. How do they understand what they're doing? We can imagine that their confession of sin is not as buttoned up as perhaps ours was about a half hour ago when we did it in worship together. Now I know there's a lot of assumptions in, the, in those statements that I made, but I think it stands to reason that without direct revelation from God, similar to what you and I have experienced or felt as the Church of Jesus Christ, responding to the Lord could be a challenge for them. Think about it. Do they confess their sins because of faith? You did. Do they? Do they use proper language or proper practice? Do they echo something similar to what we hear in Acts when the other Gentiles tried to cast out demons in the name of the God of Peter and Paul without understanding who that God is? Do they even understand what they're saying when they confess sins? And ultimately, does any of it matter when a faithful response comes from deep inside the heart to God? For when grace comes in, when God steps into your life, when you feel God step into the room, when grace breaks into your presence, does not something change deep in you? And to quote our Methodist brethren, do you not feel your heart strangely warmed by the presence of God? and the faithfulness breaking through into you. The second lesson from Jonah's story for us today is that our faithfulness does not have to be neat and tidy for God to use us. We do not have to be the perfect models of faith for the Lord to walk into our midst and act upon us on our behalf. Instead, we just do the best we can in the moment with the Lord by our side. God can work with all of it because God loves us just the way we are. Messy, with half-hearted commitments and sloppy faithful practices and behaviors. It doesn't matter. God and His grace, it breaks through. It has always broken through and it still will break through. 
And Jonah teaches us this fully and completely. So if God's call stays with us, if like Jonah, the message of God, God, the call to faithful living and action is repeated in our lives, even in seasons and actions, it is repeated over and over again, even when we might go the exact wrong direction, have selfish motivation and a desire for self-preservation. And if God uses the messiness that we offer him to redeem and to save us, then that gives each of us, it should give each of us, space to wonder about what's next for us as a church in our community. It gives me space to wonder about what the future holds and what happens next in our lives as Christians and as a church. For I am sure that try as we might, persist as we do, our actions and our choices to follow the Lord are not what we aspire for them to be. And yet, grace breaks through. God is faithful to us. God believes in you, in us. I wonder how this idea, this level of faithfulness might speak to you, what it might ask of you, how it might call you to try, how it might ask you to listen to the voice of the Lord down a new path or a new mission or a new way. Who might it ask you to talk to, reconcile with, speak to? You might get it wrong. Jonah did. You might not do it right. The Ninevites didn't. But God's grace breaks through because God is faithful always, always and forever. I wonder whom and that calls you to speak to and how that asks you to be faithful today. Let us pray together. Loving God, we seek to be faithful as the body of Christ. Knowing that we're messy at times, we get it wrong more often than we'd like to admit or acknowledge. But yet your grace overwhelms us and breaks through for us. Help us to remember that. And as you break through for us, help us to live into that, to share that with those around us, to care for those around us, to love those around us as you have loved us. Give us imagination, courage, and witness, a story to share so that we can be faithful to what it is you're doing in our lives and how you're imagining us to encounter our community. It's in Jesus' name we ask this together. Amen. In response to the word of the Lord, will you stand as you are able? As we confess in one voice what we have come to believe, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, will the ushers of our church please come as we prepare to receive today's tithes and offerings.
We bring you these gifts. We trust you to use them for your glory. We dedicate these gifts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is We Have a Story to Tell the Nations. The words are in your bulletin this morning.
stand for the blessing. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned and received, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Amen.